Well, thank you everyone and welcome. Welcome to the Alzheimer's Association, Northern California and Northern Nevada's first Facebook Live of 2023. Today, we're speaking to my colleague, Erica Neal, one of our community relations specialists. She's here to talk about Black History Month and her work, her outreach, closely aligning with the African-American community, especially here in the Bay Area. Welcome, Erica. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to talk about um, what we started talking about last week at our Raising Awareness in the Black Community event. Can you tell me a little bit about um, Martin Luther King Day and how they kept things off internally as well as with the public? Absolutely. So um, I got a chance to travel to our Southland chapter, Los Angeles, um, with one of our incredible volunteers from the Bay Area to see the unforgettable play. Um, it was a great way to kickstart um, a, a historical weekend um, and bring in a lot of the uh, just great energy that we got from our leading into summit um, before going into Black History Month. Uh, we talked about, of course, the uh, lack of representation of clinical trials in the Black community, um, but what we can do to start taking steps to continue our education about Alzheimer's and dementia as well, um, from and just make, paying, paying attention to cultural aspects um, in regards to that. So can you touch on a little more about cultural aspects, you know, working with um, African American seniors and maybe church leaders or community leaders. How how does that factor into your outreach? Um, I'm I think we are extremely blessed to be a tight knit community, and many of our organizations, churches, uh, sororities, and fraternities have health committees or health ministries that do incredible work of educating their their congregation on different diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Um, and we've done our, our end of connecting with those churches um, and starting to get back integrated into uh, sororities and um, other Black organizations like the 100 Black Men of America, uh, the National Council of Negro Women, um, and Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity. And when you talk to community members and perhaps people new to the Alzheimer's Association, do you find that they're surprised about the statistics surrounding the African-American community and Alzheimer's disease? I feel like I get a good mix um, of people that are just learning about it, either through their own family members' experiences, and then they come in contact with the association. But then we also have a strong community of uh, volunteers that uh, are very well-versed on what the disease looks like for not just the general uh, public, but for the African-American community as well. Um, but when I do my events, I go in and, and level set and make sure that people know what to expect with Alzheimer's, what are the risks, what are the signs and symptoms, um, and what does that look like for the Black community? When you first started uh, going out and meeting with folks and really you know, gathering champions and advocates, what were you most surprised at? Um, did they want to engage? Did they say, how can we help? I mean, what was your first reaction? I have to um, give my kudos and credits to the uh, Black Alzheimer's uh, Advisory Council that we have in the Northern California chapter. Um, they helped to get me out into the community and to, for, especially for those that we haven't engaged with yet. Um, and when we go out to table or speak at events, they're very excited to see us because many of them have family members that they are concerned about cognitive health um, or they themselves don't necessarily know the difference between aging and dementia. Um, so I make sure that whenever I go out, I say that Alzheimer's is not a part of the aging process. It's not normal. It's something that we have to take care of, um, whether that be going to the doctor's office or starting off with simple education, um, and it's well received. And tell us a little bit more about your advisory council and, and how long they've been 
you know, convened and what are some of your goals for 2023? Yes, yeah, so the advisory council started way back in 2017, which feels like a little long ago, but <laughs> time is kind of a weird space for us right now. But I, I think the, the goals this year is, of course, to continue expanding our reach, be more, being more inclusive of all of our chapter offices, including Fresno and Sacramento, um, and also making sure that we're reaching some communities that we haven't before. I think we've done incredible work in uh, Alameda and in Contra Costa. Um, but a few of our council members know that there's still plenty of work to be done in our South Bay and San Mateo counties. Um, so we connect again with historically black organizations, churches and coalitions to help spread the word that we're here to help and that we're here uh, for all communities. And so you had a virtual event uh, last week. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you learned and um, how engaged the folks were? Absolutely. So our Raising Awareness in the Black Community event was um, an awareness presentation. Um, we talked about not only the hallmarks of the disease, the knowing the 10 signs and the symptoms associated, uh, but we got a chance to dive into an even bigger conversation of how do we maintain awareness, not just about the disease, but about resources that can help support one another's journey, such as clinical trials. Uh, that was a really big question in our Q&A of how do we make our communities more aware of the trials that we're eligible for? And I was really happy that we got a chance to highlight the trial match service that we offer with the association um, and giving back that transparency that's very much needed in the clinical trial space. Um, we talked about the what also deters other communities of color from signing up, such as eligibility, especially if the trials are very one dimensional and only wanting people that don't have diabetes or hypertension or other ailments that okay. many of our community suffers yeah. with. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was a very fruitful conversation um, and, and a very informative presentation that uh, gave us a good starting point to continue throughout the rest of the year. Do you think that, have you found in the past nine months that there's any cultural stigma to identifying that someone in your family or yourself may have Alzheimer's Association? Can you talk and touch a little bit about that? Absolutely. I think it's hard on most families, no matter where we come from, to have someone that we love go through something like uh, as devastating as Alzheimer's um, because it is debilitating, it's frustrating, um, and it can be really dehumanizing for the loved one that or ourselves that are going through it. Um, it's harder for us to reach out and ask for help. And many uh, people in the African-American community that might be providing care to one another may not identify as the term that we often use, caregiver. And that automatically can remove them from thinking about resources that could benefit their own health as they are caring or preparing to care for their loved one. Um, we see it as a, a, a part of the journey when we're taking care of our elders, not as an additional task. Um, and another part of that is we also, when we talk about resources, we talk about accessibility. Um, it may be harder for us to reach to, to those communities that may not be online all the time, um, that may not have access to Wi-Fi. So what else can we do to make sure that our support systems in the community can share our information as well, whether that be through doctor's offices, health fairs and events. Um, so it, it's really important to keep all of those things in mind um, for me, especially as I move forward and continuing to educate the community in the Bay Area, um, especially in predominantly Black communities like Alameda County, Contra Costa County, and our small but mighty communities in Santa Clara County, as well as San Mateo. So what I'm hearing you say, Erica, is really meeting people where they are, whether it's the digital divide, whether it's access, cultural barriers, whatever the case may be. And so I'm really curious, this is, you know, the, 
the statistics are very serious for the African American community. Health in general, there are several health disparities, including Alzheimer's. And so when you talk about, you know, this serious statistic, how do you move community members to action to take that next step? I first start by being honest and transparent about the statistics. African Americans are twice as likely to be diagnosed, and that doesn't just stop at that diagnosis. Um, sometimes, a lot of the times, we're also at a higher rate of being diagnosed in the later stage. And that means that we may not be eligible for treatments, and that can lead to higher cost of care, care that's already hard to get to um, and to afford in the United States. Um, those are three main areas that I push for to educate about, and that leads into the conversation of early detection. There are cognitive assessments that all of us are able to get um, and talk about with our doctors, um, but even more so, there are a lot of free resources within the association that can help you get connected to some of the free resources in your community. Um, so it's important to, to talk about these statistics with transparency and with hope because we do, we're in an era of treatment and there is uh, hope for those who are living with this disease. Uh, but it starts with being aware of what is out there and what you need to know and how does this disease impact you if you are someone who is also dealing with a heart condition or is also dealing with um, other ailments. Yeah, you're so right, Erica, with the early detection because that, you know, means you may be eligible for a clinical trial if you're in that early onset, early stage. It means that you know, the era of treatment is more applicable to you. So Absolutely. I hear what you're saying. Um, so tell us a little bit about in the past nine months, what has been the most uh, promising fact or item? You know, is it the energy of the people you meet? Is it um, that the, there is a new era of treatment? What do we have to look forward to? I'm very much looking forward to the intersectional work that I do within our diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Um, we not only highlight the disparities that are, that are within our community, but also highlight the disparities within those intersections, such as um, our Black and our LGBTQ community members and what that risk poses uh, or additional risk can pose to having a diagnosis um, and why early detection is important. Um, we also highlight that or plan to highlight that intersection between our Afro-Latina community um, because there is health disparities that belong to both communities but put each other at an even higher risk. Um, so I, I look forward to the fruitful partnerships that come out of working with churches and coalitions or uh, faith-based coalitions. Um, I'm looking forward to unforgettable, hopefully coming to the Bay Area because um, as we've heard from Dr. Carl Hill, there is a, a component of how we learn that should be taken into consideration when we're sharing this material with our community. Um, and we do learn best in, in, in spaces uh, that we also can be entertained in. Um, and lastly, I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to the incredible events that all of our staff members put on and how we can continue to share that resource, uh, which is again, 100% free. Uh, for people to be able to attend, um, whether that be virtually, in person, um, or a combination of both, because this information is really important. Um, and I think that it can be lost in, in the midst of all the things that life has for us. Um, but we do our part, um, and I do my part, to keep it at the forefront of our community members' minds. Um, because I think that's how we're going to eventually move into a, an era of a cure, hopefully. Well, you just led us to um, what is going to happen in the future. And I know you're having a March 7th seniors and finance program on Facebook Live. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what inspired you to create this program? Yes, so many of our volunteers and community members are already taking incredible steps to bring that education right to our community and our people. 
Um, one of which is Karen Childs, who created her own Facebook page for children of parents with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, it's grown to over 70 people from the African-American community. Um, and they've asked for more assistance, more guidance on how to manage caregiving and finances. And I think that is, a, is an incredible topic to continue on after raising awareness. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to this event on Facebook Live and on Zoom for those who are outside of this Facebook group that are looking to join. Um, we'll be taking place on March 7th at 6 p.m. Uh, so please feel free to join. Uh, I believe that this uh, registration link will be shared with you all as well. Um, and it'll be a fruitful conversation. We'll not only hear a, a, a good presentation, but we'll be hearing from a couple of current caregivers that are having to practice these uh, tools and resources every day. Um, so come out and learn more about what that looks like for the African-American community. So before we close, Erica, what do you want the audience to know about your first Black History Month with the Alzheimer's Association? It's not over, but you know, what impression do you want to leave? Black History Month is a time for our community to reflect on, and all communities to reflect on, the contributions that Black Americans have made in the United States and beyond. Um, I want for people to take away that this is a really good starting point if you haven't already started your education about that. But it is by no means an end. Black History is 365 days a year. Um, and it includes not just being aware of the historical figures, but what puts us at risk within our community. And this information is just as important. Um, we talked about uh, this month, the uh, Black history historical figures that contributed to Alzheimer's research. Uh, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, uh, who was in the room with Dr. Ailos Alzheimer translating his very first case um, of Alzheimer's disease into English. Um, but it goes beyond that, you know, that's a perfect example of what access looks like in terms of making sure all of this information can be read um, by many communities, but it also can take place today by ensuring that all of our communities have this information. Um, so if you need pamphlets, this is the time to reach out to us. Uh, if you need a, a small cohort or a small presentation, this is absolutely the time to reach out to us. We are here for you and we're here for the community um, in the Bay Area. Thank you so much, Erica. And I wanted to end by letting folks know that the Alzheimer's Association has a 24 seven helpline. And we encourage you to call any time of day. It's 24 seven. And the helpline number is 800-272-3900. And, you know, it's a, it's a really important resource, as Erica knows. And, um, you know, having spoken to some caregivers of individuals living with Alzheimer's, they say that they've used that often um, just to hear a friendly voice and receive some support. So I want to thank you so much, Erica. I've learned so much listening to you and, you know, you really represent the Alzheimer's Association and you're an integral part of our success. Thank you, Terry, and thank you all for joining us. I had an amazing time and I'm still having a good time educating the community. Um, so please give us a call, reach out to us um, and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you.